here's the first uh, challenge we have. We are reverse terraforming the Earth systematically. Because of our expectations of buildings, we seem to think it's OK that buildings have a negative impact on our surroundings. And the best that we can possibly do is to have zero impact. Well, I'd like to change the paradigm and think about how we could build life-promoting cities. How could we have a building that doesn't negatively impact the environment at all? How could it possibly um, help us uh, create more lively and more fertile um, surroundings so that we change the character of human development? Well, the breakthrough technology has been around for maybe 25 years or so. And I would say that that is a portfolio of biotechnologies, synthetic biology, and even um, uh, smart chemistries. Um, and all of these have the quality of living systems. And because now we are able to uh, program and uh, harness these living properties to such a degree and with such precision, we can now think of life itself as being a kind of technology. So what does this do? This, this means that we don't just let life do its thing. We can actually start to program this. Um, and there's a, um, a field of computing called natural computing where we can actually work with physics and chemistry as the hardware and software, and we can start to manipulate matter in a programmable way. And if you think about buildings, they are nested sites of con sensations of technology. And because we have um, a monoculture of machines, we have a particular kind of metabolism that we're nurturing. You look at these um, air conditioners on the back of a skyscraper here. I mean, they're all using a particular kind of fuel, and they're all producing a particular kind of product. Um, and what we really need is a speciation of our buildings, different kinds of technologies inhabiting our buildings um, with different kinds of metabolisms. We also need to think about our buildings not as being barriers to nature, but to letting nature in. So what happens if we let this uh, force called nature inside our homes? How might we do that? Well, we can start to think of it, actually, as being a continuation of a practice that we've done, um, well, since we started farming, really. Um, nature is a technology. I consider uh, technology as being the way that the mind becomes embodied in the process of problem solving. And so, for example, when we had a problem with transport, we roped a horse. Um, and similarly, you know, um, agriculture, farming, gardening have all been kinds of technologies that have helped us thrive and flourish. Now, um, today we have vertical farms, but I would propose that with the advent of biotechnology, we're looking at forms of microagriculture. Um, and these could be forms of chemical agriculture. So this is an installation that I did with Philip Beasley. I designed a set of chemical um, sensors, which could sense um, carbon dioxide in the environment and slowly change color as people breathed out the respiratory gas. And so we could think of this as a giant smell or taste system, because it's actually detecting and responding to your presence. Um, but we can also do this for microorganisms. So things like um, algae um, bioreactors. Um, you know, algae are a fantastic work, uh, workhorse. Um, they are able to eat carbon dioxide and sunlight and turn that into biomass, oils. Um, and then these products can be used for all kinds of things, from making uh, materials to uh, creating compost um, to fueling a, a lawnmower or a, some other um, fuel burning system. But the thing is that when that system um, is, is burning um, and producing carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide goes back into the algae bioreactor and feeds it. And so we're starting to create um, metabolic systems um, within our domestic environment. So this is actually a technology that's going to be installed on the Greenwich green roof um, in the Stockwell building, which, which is a new architectural building for the University of Greenwich. Um, and essentially, this is a research station that we're starting to um, get data from and find out just how efficient this is using a local species of algae and, and just what that means in terms of local produce. And the ambition is to turn us from being consumers into producers of our environment. 
Um, and so once we start to link together these kinds of bioreactors, I mean, maybe we can use um, uh, methane-producing bacteria, which also produce a kind of biogas, which gets burnt, which goes to feed the algae. Um, and the biomass from the algae might feed the methane-producing biogas. Um, and, and so we kind of have ecological systems. We can think of our buildings as having physiologies, you know, producing bioluminescence. And so once we start linking these together, we're starting to think of metabolic cities, not as a, not as a, um, a metaphor like the Japanese metabolists, but actually as a literal process of physical and chemical transformation. And ultimately, we can start to address one of the biggest challenges that we're going to face this century, which is the depletion of our fertile soils. In fact, cities have a similar surface area to our fertile soils. So um, our cities cover roughly 2.5% uh, of the Earth's surface, and fertile soils are somewhere between 3 and 5% of the Earth's um, surface. So if, our, if we actually used our waste, if we ate our waste within our buildings and turned that into fertile soils, then we can actually start to think of our cities as being a self-replenishing fertile system, which potentially could help us continue to thrive. Now, of course, there are challenges with these ideas. I mean, our buildings are designed to be dry, and they're designed to be inert, whilst we are wet and lively. Um, so that requires a, a, a different kind of thinking. Um, and perhaps our buildings should actually not be drains, but should be circulatory systems, where not only are we circulating water within um, underimagined spaces within our homes, like cavity walls, um, you know, I think we could actually be much more imaginative about how we actually use space and think about how we can design with process um, so that we're starting to think of design as being a dynamic set of relationships. What we could, could call it horizontal coupling between um, lively systems. And actually the design becomes about how we spatially and temporally place these, these, these hubs of agency. And in some ways, because these sites are active, we are co-designing alongside them. So it's not just humans building the living spaces that we're in. We're actually also appealing and working with the non-human world through things like natural computing, which have a shared language in physics and chemistry. Um, and ultimately, you know, we can start to think of maybe um, you know, the DIY bio movement, maker movements, not to have um, uh, you know, central programs that this happens with, but perhaps we can get you know, fringe forms of transformation. Maybe we can get niche sites around London, for example, um, you know, thinking about you know, what, a, what a, um, a metabolic architecture could be or a living architecture. And this is a, um, a, a drawing that was done by a studio, you know, where we're using things like um, pigeons as carbon dioxide sensors, who are the little um, sensors on their feet, um, actually reusing um, the, the, the river as being you know, sites of production as well as transport, um, and just, just essentially kind of reimagining um, the vibrancy of the city, not as a set of iconic structures, but actually as a set of dynamic metabolic processes that can continue to help us to thrive. Thank you.